The first scene of the film takes place in a Japanese maximum security prison, which houses only the most notorious criminals. Two guards are going through the cells one by one when they eventually find the isolation cell, where Suzuki, apparently the most dangerous criminal in Japan, is allegedly being held. He is a middle-aged man who has spent many years in captivity. Suzuki smiles and pulls out one of his teeth as the guards depart. The guards come back a little later to check the perimeter. But Suzuki has left by this point. When a guard feels a presence, he flashes his torch across the area. Suzuki, displaying his Parker prowess, manages to avoid the light silently. He then hangs onto the wall until the security personnel start looking again. When the guards finally get to the isolation cell, they realize Suzuki has fled. They promptly ask for assistance. And soon army generals are encircling the area. Suzuki runs through the top of the penitentiary while an alarm sounds in the distance. It begins to rain as he approaches a dead end. And the picture cuts to a flashback. A medium security jail receives a fresh group of inmates 12 years ago. Suzuki, who is serving a 10-year term, is one of those inmates. He is a quiet person who never speaks. And he has an odd tattoo of Mount Fuji turned upside down on his breast. Suzuki is also revealed to be well known for breaking out of prisons, having done so three times. Although the guards are well aware of this knowledge, they are confident that Suzuki won't manage to escape this time. The next shot shows Suzuki being led to his cell, a compact space with a ventilator perched on top. He seems to be thinking about something as he fixes his gaze on the ventilator. Outside, a guard speaks to Mr. Kamura the jail warden, and tells him that Suzuki will be taken care of. Suzuki, though, has already escaped when he glances through the door. The prison quickly prepares a massive manhunt to find the fugitive convict. They create a complex strategy to circle the entire town since they think the criminal is brilliant. Surprisingly, though, they manage to locate him in just 20 minutes without even breaking a sweat. Suzuki was running directly through the train tracks for some reason. He is later sent to the same cell. But this time his hands are restrained. A guard sees Suzuki with his head covered in a blanket when he glances through his door. The angry guard orders Suzuki to sleep with his head out. But Suzuki ignores him. He is consequently severely beaten. The warden is seen reviewing Suzuki's prior incarcerations documents the next morning. After some investigation, he discovers an odd coincidence. Suzuki was swiftly apprehended at the nearby train tracks after every prison break. The warden and a guard conduct a nighttime regular inspection of the facility. They are shocked to see that Suzuki has released his handcuffs when they walk into his cell. The impatient guard presses Suzuki to explain how he pulled off such a ruse. But as usual, he declines to answer. He is punished once more as a result. Suzuki is observed fiddling with a little wire one day. It is the same gadget that is assisting him in removing his handcuffs. And he has managed to bring it inside his cell. You already know the answer to the question of where he hides it. The warden departs from the jail in the next scene to spend a week with his family. The guards relax while he is away, which offers Suzuki the ideal opportunity to carry out his strategy. He pulls out the roll of wire and tries using it to open the door. After some time, a guard eventually shows up to look around. He checks through the door and sees Suzuki has once more been sleeping with his head covered, but this time, he simply disregards it. Just then, it is shown that Suzuki is observing the guard from above. He has already broken out of the cell and he is now watching for the best opportunity to leave the structure. He continues to ascend after the guard has left until he reaches the top. He then punches a hole in a weak location in the roof and flees the scene. The moment the guards learn of this, they sound the alarm. When the warden learns of the escape, he or she decides to go back to the prison. The warden shows up the following morning as the authorities are organizing the manhunt. He advises the gang to scrap all of their preparations and send just one team to the adjacent railroad tracks. The officials are shocked since they don't think Suzuki is stupid enough to hide in the same place. But they accept when the warden assures them that he is certain, unexpectedly. His forecast comes true, and the fugitive criminal is once more apprehended close to the railroad tracks. As soon as he leaves the prison, it looks as though all of his intelligence starts to dwindle. The warden is given a promotion to a senior position in the Ministry of Justice the next day as compensation for his quick thinking. He must now forsake his responsibilities at the prison. His new responsibility is to travel to different prisons across the nation and assess the inmates' living quarters. Suzuki, on the other hand, manages to escape his cell once more and is caught close to the railroad tracks. He is moved around to different prisons every year. But none of them are able to keep him there. As a result, he is dubbed the breakout king by the media and he gains cultural significance. He eventually gets so well-liked that children begin to look up to him. 
The movie then jumps ahead 12 years to the point where Suzuki is being moved to the central prison. This time, he is being closely watched because a number of guards have been tasked with watching over him. Even his cell, which is totally made of concrete and has numerous locks on the door, is a nightmare. We learn that this is the identical isolation cell that we first saw at the beginning of the film. Suzuki searches the entire cell after the guards have left, looking for anything that might help him escape. A guard delivers food one day, and he puts it in Suzuki's cell. Suzuki unexpectedly handcuffs him and tries to injure him as he is ready to depart. The guard as a result whistles and signals for help. A number of men quickly show up and beat Suzuki to a pulp. When he comes to, he glances through the door's little opening and watches the guards as they walk. Blood seeps onto the iron bars from his face as he works. The guards hope that Suzuki won't be able to unlock his handcuffs this time by adding a few extra screws the following morning. They punish him with yet another terrible act before leaving. Suzuki begins to live out his days in this manner. He purposefully assaults the security personnel, is thrashed, and leaves blood on the iron door bars. The guards beat him so severely one day that one of his teeth fell out. Suzuki snatches it up unexpectedly and grinned like he had planned it all along. Suzuki is seen using his tooth to make a mark on the wall in the following scene. When a guard is present, he instantly inserts the tooth inside his mouth where it belongs. Suzuki strikes another another guard a few weeks later. This time, he goes too far and receives the harshest penalty. They bring out a lengthy chain, tie him up, and force him to assume a challenging position. He remains in the same condition for days on end. In an unexpected turn of events, Suzuki begins singing one day. His ability to talk is eventually made clear. The narrative then jumps ahead a year, and poor Suzuki is still receiving the punishment. He has begun to resemble a castaway, and maggots can be seen crawling through the cuffs on his hands. Thankfully, the guards eventually enter his cell that evening and remove the chains. As a result, after a full year, he can finally rest. Mr. Kanemura, an ex-warden, arrives at the prison in the meantime to see the facilities. As he gets closer to the isolation cell, he sees Suzuki, who is weak and ill. He simply ignores him and continues walking. The same night that we witnessed at the beginning of the film is the next place we are taken. Suzuki continues to carry out his plan as it begins to thunder outside. He seems to have been anticipating this day for more than a year. He pulls out his teeth and begins to undo his cuffs fasteners. Here, we learn that Suzuki wasn't actually painting the walls. Instead, he was simply honing a tooth so that it would fit the screws. After removing his handcuffs, he moves toward the entrance and begins to shake the metal bars. Surprisingly, the metal bars have rusted and are now easily removable due to the frequent stream of blood. With this, he eventually escapes from the entire facility as well as his cell. The scenario that follows transports us to Suzuki's birthday in the past, while his father is languishing in prison. His mother passes away owing to problems during delivery. He is consequently reared by his extended family. One day, Suzuki is practicing Parker in the woods when his fugitive father unexpectedly approaches him. After some time of friendship, Suzuki finds that his father has the identical tattoo on his chest. Sadly, their conversation is cut short as the police show up and start pursuing the father. As a result, Suzuki makes a commitment to one day meet his father. Returning to the present, Suzuki is stopped by Mr. Kanemura as he is once more going through the tracks. He is asked to halt by the former warden. And surprisingly, he does. After a while, some guards show up and remove him from the area. The director of the criminal division instructs Mr. Kanemura to accompany Suzuki to the prison aisle. The world's most lethal prison. After realizing that even the strongest prisons could not contain Suzuki, there are no other prisons like the prison aisle. It is situated in the midst of the ocean. Surrounded on all sides by exceedingly hazardous currents. Additionally, sharks can be seen in the neighboring waters, making escape impossible. The penitentiary's interior is just as scary. Around the facility, hundreds of guards are authorized, and anyone attempting to escape is shot dead right away. Additionally, the inmates are fed poisoned food, which gradually drives them insane. Suzuki gets imprisoned in his cell as soon as he arrives at the location. Suzuki is confined throughout his entire body by the cell, which is basically a collection of rods put together. He is therefore not allowed to move a single inch, much less run away. Mr. Kanemura enters the jail library and begins looking for information regarding Suzuki in another location. He ultimately finds some old files after some looking around and examines them. Suzuki is meditating in his cell back inside the jail. He appears to be planning an escape even if it seems impossible. He eventually puts his concentration to an end and opens his eyes. He then moves gently out of the cramped space after dislocating both shoulders. A prisoner sees him in the act, 
but because he's too drunk, he doesn't say anything. The alarm on the island sounds as Mr. Kamura continues to work on his studies. The prison warden, though, is no longer concerned because there is essentially no way to leave the island. He is also happy that his guards have finally been given the chance to execute a prisoner. Mr. Kamura tries to inform the warden that Suzuki is brilliant, but he is ignored and told that the search effort would start the next morning. Each guard is equipped with a rifle and is sent out throughout the island early in the morning. Mr. Kamura unexpectedly shows up and tells the warden and the rest of his men that Suzuki is actually hunting for his father, who is also confined on the island. Everyone is shocked by this, and this is where the truth is at last made known. It turns out that Suzuki had everything planned out from the beginning, in order to eventually reach Prison Isle. He purposefully put himself in prison and managed to escape from there each time. His major objective is to locate his father and flee with him. In another scene, Suzuki sees his father for the first time, and they share a touching reunion. Sadly, Mr. Kanemura, the warden, and a large group of other guys are also making their way to the same place. Surprisingly, Suzuki and the elderly guy had already left when they arrive. In the film's last scene, Suzuki leads his father to the edge of the island, where he is waiting with a paraglider. The two then climb on the glider and take off. In the meantime, Mr. Kanemura tries questioning an elderly guy who shared Suzuki's father's room. He is startled when he suddenly finds the similar tattoo on the man's chest. Suzuki has escaped with the wrong man after all these years of plotting. Mr. Kanemura explains as the film comes to an end. 